So Diana, people will be very interested to know how you start that process. My dear, it's usually luck. You, you don't expect it. It just happens by accident. I don't believe that, Diana, because I know how hard you work. Oh, well, my dear, it's my pleasure. It's my idea of fun. Isn't it ridiculous? But that's how I am. Welcome to If Jewels Could Talk. I'm Carol Walton, the voice of jewellery, an author, broadcaster, and the woman who initiated the role of jewellery editor at magazines like Tatler and British Vogue. This is a podcast for everyone, for people who do like jewellery, for people who don't realise they like jewellery, and anyone intrigued by fascinating facts, new ideas, and forgotten histories. So please join me as I tell sparkly tales, meeting all sorts of people, delving into four centuries of jewellery culture, and investigate what's happening now. I'm lucky enough today to be talking to the jewellery academic, Diana Scaresbrick. She's one of my personal heroines. She's a one-woman walking encyclopedia on the subject. She's an author, curator, specialist in neoclassical gems, who's used her training as a historian from Oxford to explain the cultural, social and political significance of jewellery. And over a 50-year career, she's written over 21 books and catalogues, including definitive works such as Rings, Jewellery, Power and Love and Loyalty, and most recently, Diamonds, 700 Years of Glory and Glamour. She's accrued this vast knowledge from intensive study and research, as well as actually possessing the objects. She's amassed a collection herself of Renaissance 17th and 18th century rings, And in her 92nd year, she continues to work as hard as ever. So I'm very happy she found time in her schedule for us today. Welcome, Diana. What I'd like to ask you first, Diana, is what attracted you to jewellery in the first place? Well, it's quite simple, Carol. The pleasure of wearing jewellery and then the fact that I had been trained as a historian, that I could use my historical background to work out what these objects signified for the people who created them, wore them, and the society in which they lived, what it reveals to us about the society in which they lived, their place and purpose. Jewels reveal so many aspects of human life. It's quite, they're they're a wonderful instrument for learning about the people who came before us. So that's, in a nutshell, what attracted me. And not least because they have that longevity that actually they survive. It's one of the artworks in their life that does survive, isn't it? Well, exactly. Particularly in England. There was a French lady came to see me the other day and she was astounded to see how many great families in England have still preserved their ancestral jewels. Whereas in France, of course, because of the division between members of a family when the senior member dies, everything is dispersed. Whereas we haven't had that. Of course, we're, a conser- we're basically conser- more conservative than the French, who always like everything to be brought up to date. Don't, nobody wants to be seen wearing granny's brooch. Whereas we're, we rather like old things as well as the new. Ancestral Jewels was your first book, wasn't it? One of the first ones, yes. I'd done a big... It took me ten years. I'd done a big work on the history of English jewellery. And André Deutsch, um, who was then a rather good publisher, suggested that I took items from it and just talked about the, the, the jewels still surviving in our great families. And that, um, that was really my, as you say, it was my first publication because I was very unlucky with the English jewellery book. It took me 10 years to write it, but it took me 10 years to find a publisher. But the ancestral jewels, that meant that set you off visiting stately homes all over the country? No, I'd already done that. You see, not Carol, not being a member of an institution, you get your independence... But at the same time, you don't get the entree to places. And I found as an outsider, 
I had to somehow make my own entree. And so I started writing to um, people. Well, Chatsworth was wonderful to me. And then Alastair Londonry was another great help because he got a, a very, very good inherited collection, particularly of diamond jewellery. Chatsworth, of course, had the cameos. Uh, as well as the uh, the other the normal run of jewels, family jewels, and um, I also found that I could get the entree to country houses because in those days we're talking about the 1980s, 1990s. Country Life published my articles, and a lot of people living in these stately homes with collections, people like Lady Ross, for example. Um, I've just been asked to comment on a bracelet that belonged to her. Um, they read my articles in Country Life and they felt I was on their wavelength. Of course, some people want, didn't want anybody to know that they had jewels, and I always respected that. If an owner said to me, please never mention my name and my family's name in connection with jewellery, I would always respect that. And so, that's how I. That's how I got started discovering things in people's uh, that people still had in their possession, and I know Sotheby's are having this exhibition. Well, ex selling exhibition of four hundred Mountbatten jewels, and one of the first people I approached was Patricia Braben, whose things are being sold now, Countess Mountbatten, and she responded immediately to a letter from me. And she took, I remember she took me to Coots's Bank in those days in Piccadilly and they opened the vaults and there she showed me all the Mountbatten Fabergé she'd inherited. I mean, some people were absolutely marvellous. And I remember at Chatsworth, I once said to Debo Devonshire how grateful I was for the access they gave me. And she looked at me with astonishment and she said, but my dear Diana, Andrew and I consider we are so lucky to be looking after these things that the very least we can do is share them with people like you. That was the attitude. So kind and so willing to help one in one's chosen path. And Carol, you've chosen the same path, so you know how thrilling it was for me. It's very thrilling. And also that people have the same view as you, that they're mm -hmm. looking at it as an artwork. Exactly. Uh, it's not bling, it's not to show off, you know, like those women you see getting into the first class uh, compartment of an aeroplane uh, with these great, great d knuckle dusters showing how successful they've been with their gentleman friends. Uh, that is nothing to, it's not like that at all. And you also catalogued the Spencer jewellery, didn't you? That's right. And Wellington gems. So you certainly um, know the ancestral jewels inside out. <laughs> well, of course, Spencer was so fascinating because there I made one of my discoveries because they were, in the days of um, Rain Spencer, uh, she and a very nice husband um, wanted to live like lords and ladies. And the revenues just weren't there, so they decided that they would sell a lot of things that um, they felt that they could dispense with. And there were some cameos and some jewels, and one of the cameos was catalogued as a sleeping dog. And as I like cameos, when this came up for sale at S.J. Phillips, I said, I think I'll have that didn't know what it was and then one day I was looking in one of my books and I found a picture of this animal and it turned out to be a very famous gem in the 18th century which had belonged to the Vatican collection and had been sent by Clement XI, then the Pope, through his nephew, the famous Cardinal Albani, to Vienna to give as a present to the famous Prince Eugène of Savoy an animal lover, art collector, and military victor who defeated with the Duke of Marlborough, Louis XIV. And when it was on Prince Eugène's finger when he died, inherited by his niece, who immediately sold it to a Venetian connoisseur who published it. And it was through that book, which I had in my possession, that I was able to identify this really rather wonderful ring. 
It, it's so thrilling when you make these kind of discoveries. And usually you make them on behalf of other people. But to do it on behalf of myself was really very gratifying, Carol. Do you think they regretted that sale? I have no idea. If they regret it, I can understand them because there were some really lovely things. So lovely things that actually um, Princess Diana should have inherited. Well... They've got the connection with her, of course, because, you know, it's her family. But I think, you see, the whole... The reason why they had this collection is because they hadn't really been distributed with each generation. They were just kept there in the strong room. And then Rain and Johnny decided that they wanted to raise the cash and the contents of the strong room were dispersed. I don't think... I mean, they've still got the tiara that um, print, the princess wore... Uh, on her wedding day. Um, they've got another tiara that has been traditionally believed to have belonged to Marie Antoinette, but I found several others like that. And um, I don't think, in fact, although it, that tiara has been shown at exhibitions, I think when one produces the information of the other ones of that design, the connection with Marie Antoinette will be very difficult to uphold. You know, legends get attached to jewels that aren't really justified in the fact, if you look into things. That's why you have to be so careful about provenance. It gives an added interest when it's true, when it can be justified. But so often when you delve into it, it's just make-believe. Just what people want to believe. And, of course, it helps with the romance of the jewel. Yes, because it does give an extra dimension to your appreciation of a subject, of, of an object, to know that it, in fact, did have, it did have an, was associated with some illustrious or famous person. It's only human nature. So, Diana, people will be very interested to know how you start that process. My dear, it's usually luck. You don't expect it. It just happens by accident. I don't believe that, Diana, because I know how hard you work. Oh, well, my dear, it's my pleasure. <laughs> you know, it's my idea of fun. Isn't it ridiculous? But that's how I am. And so really it's by looking at um, documentations, by wills, ledgers. Having a good library. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just not leaving the books on your shelves or the documents in drawers, but actually perusing them. And suddenly, something rings a bell. But it's got to be a good object. And you have to have a memory. You have a very sharp memory because you remember every jewel, portrait, ledger that you've ever seen, don't you? Well, I hope so. <laughs> but I've seen an awful lot of, 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 in my um, in my life because I'm, as you know, 92 now. And I've been at this, you know, since I was about, for about 50 years. So it's half a century of looking, isn't it? And I think you, you said to me once that um, it was cataloguing the Devonshire Perreur. That's right. That really sparked your, your love of cameos and intaglios. Oh, definitely. You see, Carol, they had the best. They've still got the best. I mean, it is a lovely ancestral collection. And the extraordinary thing is, there are three of them in England, still undispersed. The one at Chatsworth, which, as you know, I've been involved in. A lovely one, some exquisite things at Annick Castle, belonging to the Duke of Northumberland, and which he was kind enough to lend me for an exhibition of cameos I did in Japan, because the Japanese love small objects. And I do a lot of work for Japan. And um, about 10 years ago, they wanted to do an exhibition of cameos. And the Northumberlands were incredibly kind and let me borrow their things. And I remember the very nice, but rather superior curator from the Cabinet des Medailles, which is the French national collection of cameos. She looked at me when she visited the exhibition because I borrowed from her too, and she said, these things are really exquisite. And I thought, yes, and they're still in English private hands. And the third one belongs to the uh, Earl of Yarborough, uh, who inherited it. And he has also lovely things chosen for his ancestor by the great Sir William Hamilton, who had the best taste for antiquities that any Englishman has ever had since the first the first one to collect and, uh, the cameos, Lord Arundel. After that comes William Hamilton. 
and his taste was, he was our ambassador at Naples, so he was very much on the spot to get anything that came onto the market from great Italian families or even dug up from the ground of Italy. So we've, we're very lucky to have those three collections and I've been very privileged to have the chance of working on them. Can you describe the Devonshire one? The Devonshire one? Mm. Well, um, there's a very, very interesting. I mean, there were ones of Roman emperors, um, well, the famous one, of course, worn by in the 19th century by the Duchesses of Devonshire uh, in the centre of a bondo, uh, which is an exquisite Cornelian intaglio that is signed by the greatest master of, of the ancient Roman Empire, um, who is called Dioscorides, Greek origin, um, and it's of the um, stealing of the Palladian, which is the statue, of, the sacred statue of Minerva, um, by a man called Diomedes, and it's just so magnificently the total economy of line. It tells the whole story with the minimum, uh, the minimum of effort, if you like. It's just it's just a brilliant piece of draftsmanship on this hard material that survived, because it's a hard stone, the Cornelian, it survived the first century BC AD, the, the rule of Augustus. That's one of the great things that they've got. But they've got not just Cornelians, and, but they've got engraved emeralds, engraved sapphires. They've got a whole series of royal Tudor portraits. This is multi-layered cameos depicting Henry VIII with his children, Henry VIII just with Edward VI, Edward VI on his own. I mean, it's just an extraordinarily wide-ranging collection, but all, everything of the very top quality. Because the second duke who was collecting these things, the English had money then, and they could afford the best. Made the French furious. So when you catalogue that um, Devonshire Parure, Something clicked inside you that made you want to specialise in engraved gems. Well, what happened was that um, I wanted to look at the Devonshire rings and we got talking to, I got, my husband drove me up there and we got talking to the librarian, Tom Rag, and he said, if you like rings, are you interested in cameos? So I said, well, uh, I'd like to be interested in them. Um, and he, sa he said, well, you see, we're putting on an exhibition in America and um, we want to show the parieur and we've got nobody to catalogue it because, you see, this is the thing. If you're an outsider, you've got to find a subject that nobody else has taken charge of because I obviously don't like interlopers. And it was very difficult for me, starting from the outside, to find a subject uh, where I wasn't considered an interloper. And in fact, nobody was interested in cameos in those days. And of course, what happened was, um, so through this uh, the librarian, he gave me the chance of working on those, uh, on the Devonshire Parieur, uh, to which I you know, devoted a lot of time. And meanwhile, at S.J. Phillips, we had the Wellington Gems. There were about 2,000 of those that I had to catalogue. And before that, um, in 1977, that was quite early, um, S.J. Phillips had got a, the Harari collection, which was rings as well as gems. And it was really doing the Harari collection in collaboration with Professor John Boardman, who, had, who was the great expert on Roman and Greek gem engraving, uh, that I got initiated into gems. And so, of course, when I went to Chatsworth um, a bit a few years later, I'd already been working on the Harari collection, uh, the post-classical. You see, John did the, um, the Greek and Roman ones, and I did the medieval and later ones, and that's how I sort of, you know, got to grips with the subject. It's nothing like actually having the things in your hands and trying to discover what they're about. That's research, that's research, but you, it's a great help to have the objects actually accessible rather than working from photographs. Photographs can be very deceptive. And with Harari and with all the, the others I've done, I actually 
had proper access to the materials itself. I also did the post-classical gems for the Fitzwilliam Museum, which was a, another interesting project because it meant me going up to Cambridge and also, while I was there, discovering all kinds of lovely things in the Fitzwilliam that I had no idea about. So what is it about a cameo that absorbs you? Well, it's the use of the material, it's the subject, what it, you know, it tells you about mythology, it tells you, it tells you about history, it tells you about naturalism, it, it tells you, they tell you about so many things, but all in miniature and using these, uh, th these wonderful materials. They can be such elaborate scenes of life, can't they? Yes, but you see, the, for instance, the famous Spencer cameo that was catalogued by the expert as a sleeping dog, which turned out to be a tiger ready to leap <laughs> with all that tension. It's a most exquisite moss agate, which reproduces in hard stone the spotted coat of the leopard or tiger. It's so realistic. So when looking at cameos, you should really, if anybody was a, an amateur looking around, they should look for exquisite detail. Definitely, because you can get it. That's the whole point of, of something that's in miniature. You do get, it's like the painted miniatures. The detail is there. If you want to learn about jewellery, you learn far more from a miniaturist than you will from um, a, a painter on a larger scale. At least that's what I've always discovered. A miniaturist has an eye for detail. And so how does an amateur tell if it's a, a good cameo? Well, dearest Carol, there's only one way. If your eye has got used to the best, it will know the best. And if it's just been looking at mediocrities and banalities, it won't be able to distinguish the best from the also rans. And most things, let's face it, come into the category of also ran. So they have to live in museums for a few years <laughs> before they go out gem collecting. Well, so as I've told you, there are these three great collections in England, which are in, still in private hands and not in museums which I think is, throws great credit on how things still are in England, that n not everything has to be institutionalised. And also, we wouldn't have an art market if everything was in museums. And you see, it's this accessibility that's so important. I don't like looking at things th through glass cases, and that's unfortunately how it is with museums. You can, own, you can learn so much, but not the complete picture. That's why the sale rooms are so helpful, because when you have when they have things for sale, there are views. I mean, I'm not talking about lockdown now, but uh, for years they've offered a free schooling, if you like. Yes, I think that's um, a very good place for people to look and learn. Yes. Um, because obviously, as you say, it's impossible to handle these things. I think, you know, you described it to me once um, when you started out, the... Um, the atmosphere at the time in London, and you said really everything was up for sale. And so you spent your time antiquing in an these antique shops. Well, London was full of them because everything was up for sale. If you think of German Street, Pimlico Road, um, what's it called in, uh, in Kensington, it was just amazing and there were sales all the time. And Bond Street was full of antique shops. So it was a much easier time to actually handle objects. Handle objects, get to know them. And in fact, there were so many that, well, you know, uh, they were much more accessible. And the antique dealers' fairs were crowded and people would queue up to go into them. And not just new rich, but professional people who had a taste for collecting, which I think is a very civilised way of spending your money and passing your time because you can learn from them. But these things are rare and there are not many on the market now, are there? The market has dried up. Goodness knows what it's going to be like when we emerge from this present lockdown. But obviously so many businesses are undercapitalised and I don't think they've been able to afford to carry on. And rents, are, rents of course, are, are, are very high, but we'll see. I'm just hoping that there won't be too much of a wreck because for me, the art market is a very important part of London, of London life. But I suppose, I mean, each period becomes quite 
sought after. Well, that's right. Even the 50s, you see. And I was reading the other day that uh, somebody's writing about jewellery of the 70s, which, I mean, it'll all... It, it's a very good, very good idea to... Um, but of course, it's so much easier now because everything is recorded. You know, there are all these magazines, um, articles are written about contemporary jewellery. Um, Goldsmiths Hall has had, uh, has been collect, has been collecting it. So it'll be much easier for the future historians. But then everything will be written about. Yes. So they've got to find their new subject. Exactly. Exactly. But it's such a it's such a vast world. I'm sure people will find. We'll, we'll find their niche. For you, what do you think is the greatest period of jewellery creation? Well, it's the 18th century because people weren't frightened of displaying it. I won't say, I mean, of course, they were highwaymen and things, but it was just a matter of course that you had good jewellery and they were always bringing their jewellery up to date, but it's got a finesse 18th century jewellery has got a finesse and a delicatesse that you won't find in any other period. It's got a refinement, and with that refinement comes what I call a beauty. And so that's really my favourite period, though of course I love the Renaissance because it's inspired by classical antiquity. And as you've gathered from my interest in cameos, I'm always interested in anything to do with antiquity. But each period has got it's good masters, but for me, it's the 18th century, whether it's expensive, made with very expensive materials or much cheaper, it still bears the stamp of good design. That's the important thing for me. How important do you think it is that jewellery is designed um, in conjunction with fashion and how people are living and what they're wearing? Oh, I think it's terribly important. I mean, think of the Art Deco period, those wonderful Cartier jewels and the other La Cloche, the other, the other makers. Um, it was all in harness with the designs of Chanel, Lucien Le Long, uh, all those people. Uh, I mean, it was so closely identified with fashion. And I remember when I was working for Show Me, I was amazed to find how in the workshop that uh, delving into the storeroom of the workshop, huge number of fashion magazines, the people who were designing, certainly in the 50s and 60s, were very aware of current fashion. It was a kind of partnership. And that's the wonderful thing about French jewellery, you see, because Fre the French were the creators of fashion in those days and because fashion really existed, couture and so on. And um, the jewellers worked in harness with them. I mean, just think of Cartier all those years ago with, with Frederick Worth. The families were married to each other. Exactly. So it was a very close connection, business-wise, as well as through family. You became fluent in French very early on in your life, didn't you? Well, you see, I was brought up in, in, during the war and it was very difficult. We couldn't go. We couldn't go abroad. But um, when I left school before I went to Oxford, I was sent to France to learn French, and this was one of the best things that ever happened to me, because through my experience of living with a French family, who had a country house as well as a flat in Paris, I became totally enthralled by French by everything French, and um, particularly the literature. So, of course, when I got the chance of um, writing the history of Chaumet, this background stood me in good stead. And, of course, one of the first jobs I had on leaving university was I was an interpreter for the French Navy, who was then based at a place called Chaif, that is Supreme Headquarters Allied Forces in Europe. And I was based at Fontainebleau, and I had to, shall we say, translate documents um, that were, everything was in English, um, and I had to uh, translate the French naval documents into English so that the American forces could understand them. And so I was quite adept at translating, and so that stood me in very good stead when I had, was confronted with this vast assembly of archives 
going back to the restoration of Louis XVIII um, after Waterloo. Because Napoleon, Chomet had been Napoleon's jeweller, that's Nito, uh, but those uh, documents are all in the Archive Nationale. So, uh, but when they became, when Nito gave up and handed the business to his head, the head of his workshop, Fossa, then in the documents, then the documentation could at the start, and it's still at Chomet, which is a huge asset for anybody interested in. Uh, the history of the of the firm and the cha- as you were saying the changing fashions and why and did you translate um, did they have any of the love letters between no- Napoleon and Josephine in the archives no but we did put on an exhibition about Napoleon and of course Josephine came into it um, <laughs> there is one terribly uh, when they the, they called it Napoleon Amoureux and I do wish we'd done a catalog. Um, but I suppose the budget didn't stretch to it. But uh, there is a wonderful that they do have a wonderful letter, uh, which um, that, which describes a visit when how Nito had go was at Melmaison and tried to get some money from Josephine, and to her horror, suddenly Napoleon appeared on his horse, and she, he asked. She said to Nito, look, for goodness sake, don't let him find you here. Um, go and hide. And he had to hide in the room, uh, whereupon Napoleon arrived and there was a, a love, a, as one would imagine, a love scene ensued and poor Nito uh, was, was there in hiding, terrified that the emperor would find him. But anyhow, he, he, he didn't take long. And as soon as he'd gone, Josephine rescued him and somehow she managed to get the money for oh, him. Funny. So, I mean, you've talked about and written about the importance of Napoleon um, bringing back the tiara. Um, that's right, in, that's right. In your book, Tiara. And the importance of jewellery in making you stand out if you're in public life, the importance of jewellery as a means, as a kind of political instrument. Definitely, he saw the point of that. All his sisters and his mothers had wonderful jewellery. So how much was he commissioning from Nito at the time? Oh, Nito had to subcontract. But of course he had, he was in charge. And so he saw, but it was a time when you got that kind of patronage, everything was done to a very high standard. And don't forget, with the conquest, money was no object for Napoleon. He had masses of money. He raised these indemnities from the countries he'd conquered. And there was plenty of money for his marshals and their wives to put on a great show, and jewellery was part of that. And, of course, presiding over it all was the imperial family, and they had the best. And with, with Josephine, of course, he'd got uh, a wife who had great taste, knew all about clothes, what suited her, what did You never see her looking as if she's wearing the wrong thing. It doesn't suit her. Well, she changed several times a day, didn't she? Yes, that was part of being who she was. And so the workshops there must have been just working day and night to produce all of this for him. Yes, but you see, considering the decline that came with the revolution, it was wonderful for them, you know. And Nito became... The reason why Nito gave up after Waterloo was because he'd made so much money. Even though Napoleon was very strict with checking... The people weren't profiteering. Nito could afford to give up and hand over the business. Anyhow, once Napoleon, who'd been his inspiration, once Napoleon had gone, Nito felt, well, what's the point? He had had the best of it. Yeah, he'd had the best of it. And when you think of the wonderful things he made, and of course what was so terrible, was the um, dispersal of the French crown jewels. Though admittedly some of the things Nito made which were, the, which were crown jewels, were, were remodelled at the, restora- at the French Restoration, which followed Napoleon. But even so, things from the second empress, Marie Louise, things from her private collection, which she was able to keep, made by Nito, have survived. And they are really just quite marvellous. The best. And he managed to... Um, claw back some of the French crown jewels at the time, didn't he, when he became emperor? Napoleon, oh yes. Uh, that. But as I say, he had all the money. They, the things were on the market, and so he was able to repatriate them. And then, of course, in Paris, in the Louvre, 
um, resides uh, one of your great discoveries that was, I think you've said, is the highlight of your career, the Book of Hours. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Well, S.J. Phillips had always had this um, Book of Hours. It's a prayer book. And again, it was the, the it was because of the covers were set with beautiful, beautifully engraved Cornelian intaglios. We knew it had belonged to Horace Walpole, and it was lent to the the last Horace Walpole exhibition as French, 16th century, but no provenance. And just by chance, I happened to be reading an inventory of Francois Premier, and I discovered this book of ours set with turquoises and rubies, the covers, and these two Cornelians, one in the front, one of the back, one of the back, the crucifixion and the deposition, and um, it could only be the one at S.J. Phillips. And so we checked and we found it in the inventory. Not a, Francois Premier bought it in 1528 from a Flemish, Flemish itinerant merchant, gave it to his sister, and she left it to her daughter, who was the mother of Henry IV of France, and it's in his inventory, it's in his mother's inventory, and then it was dispersed with the terrible wars in the, the Civil War in the 17th century, and eventually ended up with Horace Walpole in the 18th century here in England. But that was, that was, a, that was a great moment for me. But it was through being able to identify the intaglios, and I still don't know who, who engraved them, but he was a master. And Francois Premier gave it to his sister, mm -hmm. and she would have worn it on a chain around her waist. That is it. That is exactly it. Because it was a jewel, as well as a useful object. This is a great thing of the, of the um, Renaissance period, is that they knew how to transform objects of utility into uh, into beautiful jewels, matching their other jewels. So the book of hours that you needed for saying your prayers was in fact, you could hold in your hands or you wore on your dress, as you say, hanging from a, cha hanging from a chain. It was of a quality that matched the other jewels you were wearing. Because don't forget the Renaissance is a great moment for jewelsmiths work. And you talked about S.J. Phillips, which for people who don't know is the great illustrious jeweller in London and Diana had a very formed a very close and long relationship with him which was another way for you to handle historic objects. Exactly and the wonderful thing is we started in the 90, early 1970s and here we are in 2021 and <laughs> we're still in almost daily contact. That's so nice isn't it to have that sort of relationship. Exactly and of course it means that you know, we have lovely discussions about the things that come in and um, we learn all the time. Everything's a new challenge. And your latest large book was Diamond's 700 Years of Glory and Glamour, That's recently right. published. Mm -hmm. And so tell me why the diamond is so interesting to you. Oh, because it's the, it, it's the ultimate. It, it's always been, even since Roman times, it's always it's the hardest substance known to man. And at the same time, with these wonderful light reflecting characteristics, uh, it's always symbolized rarity, beauty, everything great. And I mean, you've only got to think of the Catherine the Great. I must have my diamonds, otherwise no, I must wear my best diamonds, otherwise nobody will know who I am when I enter the room. They do it. They make you stand out. They catch the eye. And they've inspired some marvellous jewellery throughout history. Who do you think wore it best? Uh, through what period? Was that the 18th century as well? Um, I suppose so, yes. Um, well, I think Catherine certainly, Catherine II certainly did. But then the Russians have always, my dear, their prodigal nature, they're always that much more magnificent, that much more but much more splendid than anybody else. It's just innate to them. And I would say the Russians take the palm of splendor. And for the palm of splendor, you need diamonds. Should we say the Tsar and his family 
and supported by their favourites of the aristocracy, they always seemed to have the money and they attracted very, very good jewellers like the Duvel family to work there. And the great thing about the Russian jewels is that they weren't dispersed until 1937, I think it was, a syndicate with the revolution. But they were always there from Catherine the Great onwards as part of the crown treasure. So you, that's why you've still got wonderful examples of 18th century Russian jewellery, which really was the best. So the British crown jewellery remains the best simply because it's still worn, not because they're the most magnificent pieces. No, it's the, the, the trouble is there's so many Victorian pieces which have got that English characteristic of solidity and massiveness. And, you know, my own taste is for something lighter, more delicate. But, of course, we've got the big stones through South Africa. You see, if you think the Cullinan, which is the biggest diamond, I think, that's ever been discovered, that came from South Africa. And then they've got the uh, diamonds given by the Indian princes, who did things in a princely way, which, of course, were gifts to Queen Victoria. And then um, I gather that there are quite a lot of Cartier jewels in the royal collection, which is good news because I think Cartier really was, as far as the 20th century is concerned, unquestionably, you know, um, led the way. All endlessly creative, endlessly thinking up new designs. And really, when you look at a sale room catalogue, and you know, it's just one thing after another, and suddenly something jumps at you from the page, and very often it turns out to be a Cartier piece. And so it's very good news that the Royal Collection includes quite a lot of Cartier. Do you think there's anyone in modern life now that you see that you think wears jewellery very well? Well, I'm not in that world, so I, would, so I wouldn't know. And people have to be so careful today for security reasons. I mean, I've seen, I saw the collection of the um, Sheik, I think it is, of, of Kuwait, and I thought he... He had wonderful taste, and when I went to the opening at the British Museum of the of his exhibition, and it was his his wife who made the speech, I remember being totally transfixed by the sight of her standing there, delivering this speech, and every time she moved her head, the beautiful pink diamond earrings that she was wearing flashed in the light, it just, it just trans, it was magical. It's the only word you can use for it. So that's, that certainly comes to mind immediately of how wonderful modern jewels can look on the, on the woman who knows how to wear them. And she certainly does. Do you think in um, researching for your many books, do you think that the purpose of jewellery has changed as the modern world has developed? Do you think we wear jewellery now for different reasons? I think it's investment for so many people. Which is sad, isn't it? Very. It, we live in uncertain times. People don't know what to do with their money. They don't buy large estates. They have great yachts. I wouldn't have thought jewellery was suited for life on a yacht. I mean, everything's so casual. Yes, so people are buying it and just putting it away. That's what I feel. And we do like to see it worn, but it's sort of, as you say, the, the, the opportunities to wear it are less. Exactly. They? It depends where you, where you are. I did the catalogue for a brilliant woman who lives in Hong Kong. And um, obviously, in those circles, um, she has plenty of opportunities to wear her very, very good jewellery. Not tiaras. She's got a bondo, but she wears it as... She wears it around the neck rather than on her head. But lovely earrings, lovely brooches, beautiful necklaces, lots of bracelets. When you started a collection, you looked for Renaissance pieces, didn't you? Yes, because of my historical thing. You see, I didn't associate myself um, with being able to wear jewelry, being, you know, going to places, but not moving in that sort of social circle. Um, so I was thinking really of collecting pieces of history. Uh, and then gradually I got into the habit of wearing lots of rings and then from wearing, wearing rings I discovered I liked looking down at 
something on my wrist, so I had a, I had the odd bracelet, and then I just I had a dress that needed a necklace, and so you know gradually, I got a, I got a collection of jewels that I could wear, and I discovered the huge pleasure that you have from wearing them. So really, people should look for things that suit them, definitely that suit them and interest them at the yes, same time. Li- like it like a dress, you know there are the wrong jewels and the wrong dress. Yeah, so try a lot on. You have to try a lot on and find the one that suits you. Exactly. And I mean, there's plenty of choice. And now, Diana, I wanted to know um, if people are learning and they're starting off looking at jewellery and understanding it, is there a collection? You know, I know you spent lots of time at the Ashmole and the Fitzwilliam, the V&A. Where would you think people should start looking to learn? Which is the best collection in your view? Well, I certainly think the V&A. But of course, the problem for them is that it's such a confined space. So it's all crammed together. You see, for security reasons, it has to be like a walk-in safe. And it hasn't got the room for the wonderful th- to really display the wonderful things they've got. Because jewellery needs space. And Unfortunately, the conditions in the V&A, um, which are enacted by Parliament, um, there just isn't the room to give the things space which they deserve. But I certainly think it's a very good collection uh, because it consists of not institutional so much, but benefactors who had wonderful eye. Look at the gems. Look at the Chauncey Townsend gems. You see, each of them is a marvellous specimen of the particular type of mineral. The emeralds are exquisite. The rubies are exquisite. Each of them is a model of its kind. Then you've got the Corey, Lady Corey, who was mad about jewellery. She left her beautiful sapphires and other jewels. You've got the Londonry jewels there on loan. You've got the um, Joan Evans great collection. Obviously, because of the quality, the respect for the curators and for the institution, you've got people who had very good taste, wonderful collections, leaving them to the museum. And so that's why I think the V&A is really the best one. You don't find that at the Art Decoratif. In Paris, you've got you've simply got the um, uh, the Art Nouveau, really, that is, is outstanding, and the Louvre. Well, it's all dispersed. I mean, the last time I was there, the Gallery d'Apollon had lost a lot of things. They were put on the in the Napoleon the Third rooms. I don't know what it's like now because it's some time since I've been there. And the British Museum as well. They spread it out, don't they? I think so. And um, also, I mean, I never liked the labelling. And uh, very often you find that the, they're tucked away in a corner, um, as you say, dispersed, not everything together, making a coherent hold. And I remember a wonderful uh, cameo of, um, that had been left by Napoleon to an English lady. That, w- that was shown right up at the top, right up so high that you couldn't see it. Somebody, somebody like me, who's normal height, uh, uh, couldn't reach up and see it. And it's really one of the greatest cameos. I mean, that came from the Vatican. Napoleon had um, been given it by, um, I think it was Pius VI when he you know, invaded Rome. Um, and he, he took it to St Helena with him and he bequeathed it to Lady Holland, who'd sent him books and all kinds of comforts when he was in exile, because she thought, you know, he'd been rather badly treated. And in, uh, shall we say, gratitude to her kindness, he left her this wonderful cameo. And you could hardly see it, the way it's displayed at the beer. They need us to, to reconstruct their jewellery rooms, I think, Diana. Definitely. And they never should have accepted all the Grundy collection. You see, it had been, shall we say, Mrs Grundy was an invalid and the woman curator k- keeper at the v name, Mrs Berry, had, in museum time, done most of the shopping for, um, for Mrs Grundy. And Mrs Grundy said, I want, um, I will of course leave it to the v But then she made a condition that it all had to be shown 
together. Well, of course, there were a lot of also brands, and the V&A couldn't accept it because I say they've got, you know, the space problem, and so instead of supporting the V&A, you know, in their intention to show just the best of the things, the BM said, "Oh, we'll take the lot." And so you've got good things as well as bad things, and which I think is, a, and I think that they should have supported. Um, they should have supported Mrs. Berry. Anyhow, my dear, it's all water under the bridge. But I think when you talk about the height of things, that's what the V&A have done so well with um, Queen Victoria's coronet that mm-hmm. they recently that saved for the nation, and and they've displayed it as at the height that Queen Victoria would have worn it. That is, you are quite right there. And, of course, the curator, Richard Edgecombe, whom I've known since he was at Oxford in 1975, Richard um, is it, a, a most dedicated person. And God knows what will happen when he retires, because there will be nobody who can equal his dedication. No, I agree with that. I agree with that. But, Diana, no one can equal your dedication to the subject of jewellery, and you've given us so much to think about and so many wonderful books to read. Well, how nice of you to say so. (laughs) But it's all been my pleasure. And we love hearing you. And thank you so much for sharing some of your jewellery stories with us. Thank you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes of If Jewels Could Talk, please go to our website, carolwalton.com slash podcasts. And if you liked it, please share it any way you can. You'll find us on Instagram where you can view images of the jewellery we talk about. And please subscribe to the podcast feed on any of the platforms where you usually find your podcasts. And we'd love a rating and a comment. Don't forget to leave us any jewel related questions because we'll answer those during each episode. And please join us again in two weeks when I'll be joined by award-winning legendary costume designer Ellen Mirojnik and Lorenzo Mancianti. No one on the planet could have missed the mass hysteria created over Bridgerton, Shonda Rhimes' Netflix show. Ellen and Lorenzo will take us behind the scenes, explain the look and, most importantly, the jewellery and how do you find 35 tiaras for the ball scene. Please join us then for our next Jeweled Nugget. Goodbye. If Jewels Could Talk with Carol Wilton is produced by Natasha Cowan, music and editing by Tim Thornton, Graphics by Scott Bentley, illustration by Geordie Labanda, and you can find me on Instagram at Carol Walton. <laughs>